Good morning and a very warm welcome to our second Back to Business seminar in partnership with Cisco Webex, live from NASDAQ Dubai. I'm Brandy Scott from the Business Breakfast Programme on Dubai Eye 103.8 and I'm very pleased to be joined this morning by okay. some of the UAE's most respected businessmen. Let me introduce them to you. Our first panellist today is Ziad Makzumi. He is a serial entrepreneur, a professional restructurer and a corporate advisor. He was the CFO of Arab Tech from 2008 to 2013 and CEO of the fertility firm IV Faki when it was sold to NMC Healthcare for more than one and a half billion dirhams. Second, we have Naeem Madad, CEO and founder of Gates Hospitality. He oversees multiple hotels and restaurants, including Six Senses Ziggy Bay, the Ultra Brasserie chain, Reform Social and Grill, Folly by Nick and Scott, The Black Lion at the H Hotel, and Bistro Des Arts. And third, we have Shukri Eid with us this morning, the Managing Director for the Gulf Region at Cisco, where he heads Cisco's business and operations. With a key focus on digitization and the Internet of Things, Shukri is helping to drive Cisco's digital agenda, their competitive positioning and business strategy across the Middle East. And Cisco, of course, this morning, are more than just our partners on this webinar series. They're part of our solution. It's software like theirs, like WebEx, that is keeping businesses around the world communicating and moving forward. Right, for our second webinar, our topic is staying lean. How can companies save money without losing their competitive edge? And it's hard to think of an industry anywhere in the world that hasn't been adversely affected by the pandemic. Revenues falling sharply, waves of cost cutting have become the norm, not just here, but across the world. Salaries, I don't need to tell you, are often the number one cost, whether you are running a giant enterprise like an airline or a small family firm. If you want to cut costs, you need to look at headcount. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. According to the UN Labour Agency, COVID-19 is expected to have already cut 400 million jobs in the Q2 second quarter of 2020 alone. The Americas have been the worst affected so far, working hours down 18.3%. The Arab states are estimated to have had just over a 13% fall. And of course, here in the Middle East, we know better than many what's happened to air transportation jobs, down by more than 20% in the US since March. We've seen Emirates, uh, we've seen other airlines cutting their jobs, affecting entire communities. So how do you trim the fat, but retain the muscle? How do you reduce your workforce while retaining a players? And how do you keep morale up with your remaining team whilst you do so? These are just some of the questions that I'm going to be asking our panel this morning. And watching us right now, good morning, we have an audience of invited guests. And throughout this webinar, we are asking you to participate, to ask questions as well, so that we can make sure we are finding out the stuff that you really want to know. So please do send them in this morning. There is a chat function in your Cisco WebEx system. Please use it. I will be peppering your questions throughout our session. Right. Let's get straight into it. Let's talk cuts. Ziad, I know you're not running a massive corporation at the moment, but you are helping other people to do so. Plus, you have decades of experience as a CFO and a CEO, not least during your time at Arab Tech. As a CFO looking to cut costs, what does someone need to do first, Ziad? Well, I, I, I think we're approaching this the wrong way. The world is changing and our strategy has to change. So we can't talk about fat because that fat was necessary when things were different. We need to talk about value and return on investments on assets. The world is changing in a way that we cannot take it back. I mean, Corona is here to stay. Unfortunately, we did not take it seriously probably in the beginning. It's changing the way we do things. We're paranoid. We're frightened and we have to uh, look at things differently. We have to look at our strategy and what is it that we're offering to our customers. So if we're talking about providing food, we have found different alternatives to provide it in a sense that, you know, the delivery business has, has, has gone up. If we're talking about entertainment, online entertainment is becoming more and more in demand and so on. I don't think we should look at it as cutting costs. We should agree, reposition ourselves as a company and maximize the use of technology that we're having at the moment, because technology is going to save us. 
is going to outsource lots of things for us. So I don't, for example, in healthcare, all of a sudden uh, you have more uh, consultation done online, uh, tests are done remotely. Uh, you send your samples to, to the lab without being there. So we're adapting to the change. The question is how much the change will take and how fast and what does it need as an investment and training and infrastructure and technology to do so? And the answer now is I don't think we have a clear idea what needs to be done. The airline industry is suffering badly. The health and food, uh, the, the uh, F&B industry is suffering bad because people don't want to leave, don't want to go. So we have to give them incentives. We have to give them security. We have to give them safety. And we have to depend as much as possible on the technology. That's my view. It's interesting what you say there, Ziad, about not looking at it as, as cutting fat. I mean, if we look, and let's not name and shame, um, but let's have a look at what we're seeing people do right and, and wrong. Naeem, what are you seeing companies here get, get right and what are you seeing them get wrong? Well, I mean, it depends on the sector. I mean, we, we mentioned Arabtech, which, again, I'm, I'm emotionally sad about what happened. Because when I took over, the, the situation was very bad. We didn't have the funding and we didn't have the support of a strategic partner. Uh, still, they, for some reason, they didn't get it right. And it's sad that such a company will go. Um, when, when I was facing that problem, I had to reposition the company and turn it from basically a construction company that owns assets to a project management that delivers uh, quality and finished products. This is, I think, what we have to do in, in, in that sense. We're already facing the change. I mean, all the malls are suffering badly because of, of uh, no one is going there, but is going to go there. Uh, we've convinced them that it's safe to go there. But all the delivery and online shopping, which should have taken place two years ago, all of a sudden is picking up. Food delivery is picking up. So we're finding ways of adopting. The issue is, as, as uh, Naeem mentioned, we still have that issue of fear of not knowing what can go wrong and who's going to pay the price. I'll give you an example. When things were bad on construction, there was a ban of uh, laborers going from Dubai to Abu Dhabi. So what do you do? You put 10,000 people and give them a, a Corona test every day so it can go. There are lots of things that we were learning that could be expensive and we're slowly learning how to manage it. Naeem, what about your wider industry? When you look at, at hospitality, what do people get right? What are people getting right at the moment and what are they getting wrong? Bradley, what we have witnessed uh, early in the piece, people went into hiding rather than actually staying in contact with their audience, communicating, coming out saying, we're here, we're here to serve you, we have alternative solutions. And the easiest thing to do was to go into hiding. And we witnessed that in a, in a big time. Um, sadly, those who went into hiding went off the radar. So people weren't actually looking at their businesses, they, they'd forgotten them. We went the exact opposite. We stayed in touch with our audience and we, as I mentioned earlier, we embraced e-commerce and the digital transformation. Uh, and whilst it wasn't about commercially uh, being viable, it was about staying in touch with the audience and making sure that we are communicating clearly and telling them we're all in this together. We don't know anything that you do and vice versa. Uh, I think the biggest challenge here is that confidence, anxiety, so this is not a global pandemic. This is a this is a global confidence issue, and it's not going anywhere. We are the ones who need to change. We need to find solutions in order to engage with the market, to give them that confidence and the the feel good factor to provide the service, uh, in order for them to engage and come out and live life as we know it best. I'm going to bring Shukri in now, who is very patiently. Um, sitting here waiting for this moment. Shukri Eid from Cisco. Shukri, what are your views when it comes to cutting costs? So, so, so I totally agree with both uh, Ziad and Naeem. I'm, I'm glad to be here, first of all. I think um, the, what we have seen with the pandemic is, is almost three phases of how corporations went responding to that sort of disruption. The first phase was more about emergency response, it's, uh, and that's marked with uh, the panic and the fear that your guests have uh, alluded to. Uh, and that is more of how do I survive? And therefore, in that sort of um, coat of guard, most of corporations are being overly tactical. Then moving on into another phase, we start thinking more about business resilience, something that is a little bit more thought of, a little bit more sober, more institutional. And then uh, in the third phase, we try to accelerate the transformation that has already been going into in our industries in coming up with a new norm or a new business model. 
the question that you've asked about the cost saving or the trimming of fat is following a very a very similar sort of approach if you if you ask uh, in the emergency response sort of a, a reactive mode a very tactical question like how do i cut cost you are going to end up coming with very tactical answers as well but those answers are not necessarily the right ones or the sober ones because what happens is that you go into things that are going to give you immediate effect and you go to either letting people go or reducing uh, office uh, spaces or going and and selling some assets liquidation and so on and it's evident that those sort of actions even though they are short term in nature and can give you an immediate relief they can actually give you a sort of devastating effect medium and longer term to your business but then as you remodel the question as what Ziad and both name were actually suggesting you start actually thinking about how do I bring efficiencies into the business? And the difference in, in posing those questions is that those efficiencies, once you build up, can have a more sort of longer term impact. They can start giving you an advantage that is long lasting rather than a, a more cost cutting action that is tactical in nature and very damaging to the business. And if you wanna even pose, you know, uh, transform that question even further and push it all the way to the end, you start actually thinking about is my operating model really outdated? Is the industry has moved on? Is my industry and business still operating under obsolete assumptions and technical limitations that don't exist anymore? That by following that model, I'm actually incurring unnecessary costs and therefore how am I going to transfer my business model, not only to bring productivity and efficiency, but to build true value, strategic value uh, source. And I can, as we go through the conversation, give example of each one of those three three buckets. We're going to move to an audience question now because I want to make sure that people are feeling as involved as possible. And we've got one that actually dovetails very nicely with a conversation that I was having with a, a friend last night. I spoke to a girlfriend of mine who basically said, it's all right for you, Brandy. You go to work every day in a, in a strange sort of bubble. You walk into a studio. It's not an, an office. If you're walking into an office at the moment, you've seen a, a lot of cuts, you've seen your, your colleagues go, and there is still a feeling right now of, of who's gonna be next. How long is it until the ax falls again? It was quite a sobering conversation, uh, I'll, I'll be honest. And, and Nandan Baraja has got in touch with us from our audience and said, and thank you by the way for using the, the WebEx chat function, we're, we're monitoring it, we've got a team here taking your questions. Nandan has said, how do I keep the, the, the best talent? How do I keep people feeling safe and, and confident and not lose them in the middle of all of this uncertainty? What Naeem called there a global confidence crisis. And Naeem, do you want to, to answer that? How do you make sure that you're not scaring the horses? Particularly in, in my business, hospitality, I think, um, unlike offices, unlike um, controlled environments, our businesses are about uh, having volumes of people engaging, mixing. So it's, it's been very challenging. And the whole two meter distancing, um, social distancing, call it whatever you may, it's against everything we do in hospitality. It's principally on the other side of the scale. So what we have tried to do is to make sure that the focus remains on three things, relevance to what's happening in the marketplace, um, making sure that authenticity stays very strong, and making sure that our people are very well trained in order to make sure that they gain the confidence of the audience. Um, in the past, we, we never used to speak about chemicals, cleaning, hygiene, all that. Today, we're communicating a lot clearer about it. We haven't changed our approach, but today we are communicating about it for the simple reason that we need people to make sure they have the confidence and they have full understanding of what we're doing in order to make sure they're safe, they're secure, and moving forward, um, come back and engage. As human beings, we, we are, we're built um, to mix and mingle. We cannot stay put, we cannot stay isolated for forever. Um, it's up to us, honestly, it's up to businesses to make sure we find solutions moving forward to re-engage and give solutions to people to come up and live life to a certain extent as we know it best. I'm going to jump in with another question then from the audience. Anne Ray, I hope it's pronounced Ray. I apologize if I've pronounced that wrong. Uh, but Anne asking, how do you know when it is time to come back headcount wise? How long can you stay working 
ultra lean without damaging competitiveness. Naeem, when do you know it is the, the time to start increasing again? What's the, the tipping point? Well, uh, the answer is, is the volume. Um, the answer is solutions to the pandemic that we have. And again, what we must always remember, we're not alone in this. The whole globe is facing the same issues. So I think communication is paramount here to the team, to the audience, to the guests um, on steps that we put in place in order to um, run our business and steps that we put in place to make sure they're safe, healthy and mitigate any risk uh, issues. And last but not least, it's making sure that we stay abreast of what's happening around the globe from solutions to the pandemic, from um, virus development. And last but not least, ideally, um, a solution for this for this disease that we're all super anxious to find, find a solution. So, so first of all, I think to your question, Brandy, what, 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 when do we know that the time is right? I think that's a, that's a very difficult question because I think it is a matter of, of uh, customer and consumer confidence rather than just doing away with the pandemic, as, as Naeem and Ziad have mentioned uh, earlier. I think uh, the question, the, the, the reason why I'm saying it's tricky is that uh, on one hand, yes, businesses can wait until the customer sort of confidence uh, actually improves, but also at the same time, uh, customer confidence gets improved through actions uh, of the businesses, the leading businesses and their sectors and the market as well, demonstrating that they are able to cope with innovation, uh, and creativity to that sort of pandemic that we face. When it comes to uh, when it comes to motivation of the workforce and how do we really keep the the good voices, we we surveyed um, uh, remote workers in twelve countries across Europe, Middle East, and Africa over the past several months, and we asked them about their experience of working remotely, working from home in particular, and what sort of lessons learned there and 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 that sort of feedback from that workforce can give us a glimpse of what is it that people are actually looking forward to. So on one occasion, 67% of them admitted that they have far more appreciation now that they have went through that phase, uh, far more appreciation for the intrinsic opportunities and challenges of actually working remotely away from the regular uh, uh, work uh, workplace. But also a staggering sort of an amazing 80% of them said, I don't want to go to the traditional model. I want that flexibility of working in a hybrid model as much as possible, but, you know, remotely and, uh, and in the office. And I want this to, to, to become a, a more permanent part of my life, my ability to uh, care for my well-being, my ability to actually uh, design my day flexibly and being uh, uh, enabled with those technological tools that actually allow me to go and bring my work, whether it's work or to the office or to a third place. And they actually believe that this is one of the, of the, of the biggest things that is going to really uh, shape their uh, motivation and shape their, uh, their well-being and happiness at work. Another element was um, the majority of people, around 75%, believe that uh, being enabled but also trained on emerging technologies that are going to invade our workplace and are there to stay is going to be key to their personal and career success in the year 2021 and beyond. So that is also introducing itself as a, as a very important element. And as I said, the third one is that more of that integration between work rather and life rather than the separation that we uh, chased for probably decades, and I think we, we, we've uh, we've lost that battle. So we're talking more about the balance through integration now. People want to to be seen not only as resources for productivity, but are human beings who have different aspects of their life, including the work that uh, that they are given. And the last element I'm going to touch on is that is that uh, people do understand that there are technology out there. There are tools out there that they can be empowered with as employees. They are saying, give me better tools, give me better technology, give me more intelligence into the processes that I'm running so I can actually become more productive and demonstrate how I can make value. People want, if, if you want to ask me what makes people more secure in their job, if they believe that their job and the way it's being done today is more sustainable, 
that they don't feel that they are uh, fighting a losing, you know, a lost battle already of trying just to trim fat one year after the other and cutting the cost. While the operating model is obviously not sustainable, the strategy hasn't changed. They are unable to imagine new realities and places where the value exists in their industries, and they are unable to go. You know, th their their leadership is unable to imagine new operating model by by which they better go and tap into those buckets of values using their skilled employees that are empowered and enabled by technology to go and capture that value. If they are able to do that, and luckily, by the way, uh, uh, in our survey, 95% of CEOs responded that they would like to technologically enable their employees, at least to provide them the same access of productivity solutions that they see at work to be able to, to be available to them uh, at home. But all this needs to fit with a, a bigger picture around how are we transforming our operating model? Are we really better enabled by a technological platform that allows us really to drive things in a more uh, efficient, productive, and effective manner? Are we using this to go and um, transform the employee experience, but also our customer experience? And that allows us a more sustainable business that I think is going to motivate people. Which is interesting. I mean, you mentioned Shukri, the, um, the third space there. And 20 years ago, I interviewed one Howard Schultz, Mr. Starbucks, who was explaining to me his concept of creating a third place. You had work, you had home, and then you had this third place that was both uh, neither and everything. Um, I don't think that when I spoke to him at the back end of the, the 1990s, this is exactly what he had in mind, however, but still. Let's touch on something you've said there, which is about the operating model changing. And we're getting in a lot of messages. And again, thank you to everyone who is using that chat function on the Cisco WebEx uh, platform. We're getting in a lot of questions about freelancers, um, about whether that might be the, the answer and how you manage them, my goodness, particularly here. And I'm interested in whether or not the pandemic might move us towards more of a gig economy here in Dubai, which we see in the US, which we see in Europe, more freelancers, less full timers, what would effectively be a bit of a sea change to the visa system that we are used to in the, the Gulf. And what could that mean long term? Naeem, what do you think? Uh, the biggest problem we're all struggling to adjust to is the speed of the, the change. The acceleration has been so fast that a lot of people are having issues coping with the speed of change. We knew it was coming. Uh, pandemic has really accelerated the whole approach, the whole um, emergency to find solutions in order to survive, in order to re-engage, and last but not least, to deliver on a, on a service quality. Um, the changes are here, and I think from as far as freelance, as far as part-time schedules, um, it's inevitable, it's here, we need to embrace it and we need to make sure that there are solutions in place for, from a visa perspective, from a payroll perspective, from a engagement perspective as well, supported on all levels to facilitate for this change and make sure that these people are here, they can work legally and they have the confidence in being active and supporting our businesses. Um, as far as our business is concerned, there's a lot of people uh, take students, for example. Students will be delighted to work in, in the industry over the weekend when we need the most. So I think the freelance, the whole casual approach, part-time, is, is here. It's here to stay. We just need to make sure we find solutions and legal parameters for them to be operating correctly. Oh, I completely oh, agree I with you. I mean, I spent part of this weekend with an 18-year-old applying, who's been applying for college in the US, and she was saying one of the things that she doesn't have on her transcript, which her peers in America do, is a lot of work experience, because it hasn't necessarily always been on the table, internships, part-time jobs, and the, the rest of it from a legal point of view. Let's have a look, though, at some of the other pieces that we would need their name. I mean, you mentioned visas, but I'm also thinking things like health insurance. I'm thinking the ability to set up bank accounts in the Gulf if you don't necessarily have an employer or a salary certificate. What other pieces will need to be in place? So medical, um, the, the, the legal documentations to be able to work. Um, I think the, the, the driving age is also to change a little bit. Public transport has to be a little bit more accommodating. So we're looking at a major infrastructure strategy change. 
in order to support the economy to proceed in that in that way and moving forward in that direction. Um, like I said, medical, legal visas, banking facilities, and, and last but not least, the, the obligation of these individuals to be able to work on short term without any commitment from privacy issues as far as uh, as employers are concerned, and last but not least, as far as competition is concerned. Yeah, which are all brilliant points. Thank you, by the way, very much to Adam. Thank you to Nandan. Thank you to Farah. Thank you to, oh gosh, this is moving fast, Lara, Salvador and Thomas for all of your messages and questions that are coming in. I really appreciate it. Here is one, I'm just going to read it straight out, that has come in from Thomas. Um, a lot of companies have spent a lot of money on renting offices for their staff here. Working from home has worked out well for a lot of companies, um, so you're saving, uh, saving money on uh, on expenses on offices what does that do to the the balance sheet what does that do to your cash flow shukri as one of the companies that has allowed people to move out of their offices and use systems like webex tell us about that equation sure so, so to be honest so uh, first of all i i think the, your question about yeah what happens when we move people outside the offices and what does that actually mean for the economy longer term I think is a very pertinent one. What's happening at the moment, uh, Brandy, is that we were forced to, uh, um, even though that, that probably existed, it would have been possible before, but we were forced to decouple the physical location from the job itself. And we were pushed into a situation to go and try that. And to your point, our surprise, it worked more than, better than we thought. At the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the, um, of, of the pandemic, when we sent people home, our concern wasn't about whether they managed to actually maintain the right productivity for a company like us, which is mostly knowledge workers. Our concern was more about burnout, meaning do we have actually the habits and the training and so on to be able to work from home without completely burning out people? And we ended up giving them days off, uh, the, you know, the first three months of the pandemic just to give them the chance to, to, cool, uh, to cool down a little bit. But I think once going back to the decoupling of the location once you do that a lot of businesses are going to reimagine completely the map of resources the job description which one which part of their functions or jo their jobs is very sensitive to the physical experience or to the location that they need to be in and which one of it can actually be virtualized and once you start talking about virtualizing it it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if it's from home or from work or the third place that you've uh, highlighted in the Starbucks example. It doesn't matter whether it's our within our borders in the same country or another country, even though that is going to open Pandora's box on a lot of things related to taxation, regulation, fiscal policy, insurance, uh, health, and, and, and so many, so many sorts of, uh, of, of, uh, of points there. But I think but I think once you do that, you are going to remap and reimagine your uh, your workforce, and that is going to bring both challenges but also opportunities because you are going to be able, for example, once you virtualize a certain skill, you will be able to utilize it better. If you want immediate access to someone who actually speaks a certain language, you can't have that in every physical touch point with the customer on every on every front desk, on every lobby, on every. But if we virtualize that asset, and I'm mentioning this as a small example, you will be able to utilize this better. You will be able to drive better rapport with your customer. You will improve their experience. You will be able to create a, a certain sort of stickiness. So there are, depending on the industry, definitely models to, to follow as part of that transformation that we were talking about. Well, Ziad, let's bring you back in now. I want to hear your thoughts on this. Are we looking at a sea change? here in the UAE, in the Gulf, in terms of full-time staff and flexi workers, in terms of office-based companies and, and, and work from anywhere companies. Do you see long-term changes as a result of this pandemic? Or do you think 12 months time, hopefully, we will all gleefully go back to where we were? Well, I don't think we'll go back to what, where we were. I mean, to me, the pandemic is like uh, an economic and social terrorist attack. This is something unusual. We have to learn how to deal with it. And it's going to force us to think differently and act differently. I mean, remote working 
has always been an idea, but there was always the concern that people would skive off and not go to do the work and properly. But I think now, I mean, within training and protocols and system, probably we can get the same productivity and, uh, and more. There are certain functions in business that, it, in my view, the old mentality, I want to see you in the office. Well, if you have the right people and the right systems, you don't need to see them in the office. I mean, the media, for example, your work, you don't have to be in, in I mean, you can have your own uh, studio at home uh, if you want. The same when we're doing uh, software development or R&D or, or work or analysis or HR functions. So I think we are forced to change. The question is, can the whole infrastructure cope with it? And uh, the way one of, one of the things I see as an outcome of that is that probably real estate will suffer again, the offices, for example, because more people will be working from home and therefore probably the demand on offices will be less. Probably, the, well, most likely the prices will come down one way or another. So uh, the change is going to force us to think differently. I remember in the old days when Kodak was one of the biggest companies in the world producing cameras, and they refused to move from uh, chemical film to digital film, and they disappeared off the face of the earth. So I think change is happening, and we have to embrace it. It's just that we, we are forced to learn very quickly. And, and the ones that learn very quickly and reposition themselves and redefine their strategy will survive and make the most out of it. Well, we're getting in, funnily enough, uh, Ziad, we've just got in a question for you saying, Mr. Ziad, as a leader in the construction and development sector, with all these changes, what do you see as the future of commercial real estate? Will we see uh, a, a halt in the building that we're seeing at the moment? Will we see a lot of office blocks left empty, repurposed? What's your view on that? I mean, I, I will see, I mean, we will see a shift in everything, everything related to uh, people being publicly in places, everybody uh, places, you know, offices and so on. The whole, I think the whole logistical support services will grow in a different manner and will re replace a lot of our services. I mean, we can see it in the food and beverage industry. There's more deliveries now than probably because of, but again, the learning, I mean, as, as uh, Naeem mentioned, we have this uh, initially when I, I, used, I went to go to a restaurant three months ago, uh, there was this, you know, every other table is empty, but now we see these, uh, 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 glass or, or partitioning. So we are adopting, we're learning how to do it. Uh, so, but I think on the offices, there's definitely going to be an impact how we operate our businesses, especially if it is, uh, if can be done remotely. And definitely I can see an impact on the real estate. I mean, we're beginning to see an impact on the real estate in general, because we don't have as many visitors. Therefore, uh, lots of developments are not being sold, but we're beginning to see the people coming in the hotel business again. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I mentioned this in another public interview many months ago, and I said, if you can get the people to get on a plane, feel safe, get off the plane, go to the hotel, go out and feel safely, then you can bring them in. If you do not, a big chunk of our economy is going to suffer to make that decision. And I think we're getting it right. It's not going to be what it is before, but on the office side, I think there will be a major changes that are here to stay. I'm going to put the question to you that we've sort of already put to Naeem, and Nargis has asked it again. Thank you, Nargis, because it's a good point. What would need to change from a regulation point of view here to really tip the balance towards more part-time working, gig working, uh, freelance working, consultancy working, call it what you will? What changes would you like to see in the region? Naeem? Sure. Uh, fundamental changes need to happen. And as, as it stands today, the visa cycle, which links into the legal perspective of banking, healthcare, insurance, um, so forth, that needs to change first and foremost in order to make sure that we have a vehicle for these guys to engage in order to become legally employable without asking any questions. It's a, it's a deep-rooted um, challenge that we need to go through. But Bradley, I want to go back to an earlier point that I made. I think the, the, the challenge is surmountable. We can actually achieve good outcome. The challenge that we're facing now is that the speed of things that are happening, we're not ready. We don't have solutions. We, have, we don't have a manual to implement. And every single cycle of life is changing. Delivery, uh, movies, medical. Um, our life in general has been tipped upside down. And we are coping day, day at a time, but we don't have solutions that have been well thought out, well trained at every level in order to execute this mega change globally. 
whether it's jumping on a plane, whether it's rules and regulations in one country versus another, whether it's anxiety, whether it's mental well-being. There's a lot we're not ready for. So the speed is the biggest issue that we are. Those who adapt and move and are agile will continue on excelling and moving forward and taking the lead. Well, we've got a question that's just come in, and it's very wide, from Suta Subramaniam in our webinar audience. Thank you, Suta. Um, I'm not sure how it's for, so I'm going to put it to all three of you um, separately, by the way. We're not going to have a webinar traffic jam, asking, what is the future of your industry? Shukri, you've been quiet for a few minutes. What do you see as the future coming out of this of yours? I, I'm, I, if, if you are talking about our industry as technology, I'm actually very bullish and very optimistic about it because I think, uh, and the answer is the first ever comments on this talk by Ziad and Naim, they talk about the import, importance of embracing technology. I think, and that goes through all the three buckets that I mentioned. Today we see technology, even if you want to go with the tactical answer of what you mentioned around outsourcing or reducing the amount of assets, I talked about how technology can help us virtualize those resources and still connect uh, to them regardless of where the location is, put them to higher utilization and more benefits, that's one. When we talk about avoiding some of the unnecessary uh, um, uh, cost and bringing efficiency, we start talking about predictive maintenance, we start talking about reduce, you know, uh, improving the facility management in terms of energy consumption and environmental footprint. We start talking about changing certain assets that have a higher uh, running costs. Uh, we start talking about uh, technical training of people so they can actually operate and reduce faults that might result in return of products or repeat of service and so on. And when we start talking about transformation, you start talking about shifting your operating model like, uh, like we mentioned. And that is either in terms of coming up with new revenue streams of finding another way to deploy your resources and utilize them of finding actually um, uh, in, in new ways of thinking the industry and, and changing the whole assumptions under which they operate. So no matter what you talk about, what this requires is more of a platform, a technology platform, if I wanna be biased, that actually allows you to learn more and get more data about how your operations are running, allow you to proactively respond to the changes both in the environment and within your operating environment, and allow you that maneuvering space to, uh, to respond. And I think that's a very critical point because of the question that you've answered. I don't think we need to go and deploy cost cutting sort of te techniques just to solve, you know, as a point solution to solve for the point of COVID. This year it's COVID, God forbid next year it's another virus. The following year it's a climate uh, crisis. The one after it's a security crisis, the one after it's a financial crisis. We are going to, to see an intersection of environmental factors coming together that is going to give us a series of disruption. Unless we have that operational uh, agility enabled by technology to allow us to shift very quickly, really sense our market and being able to respond, I think we're going to be, you know, go for a, for a rough ride. So, I, so that is why I'm basically very optimistic, at least about the role that technology is going to, to play in getting businesses in general probably even in a better shape, more sustainable shape out of this crisis and ones like it. Naeem, two minutes, Naeem, the future minutes. of hospitality, your industry. Extremely positive. I think people are dying. People are commanding a change. People are looking for a change. People want to travel. People want to eat. People want holistic wellness. People want that engagement. It's really up to the operators, up to the individuals to make sure that we embrace the digital world that we're living in, apply it in a way that actually complements our business and deliver. I think from a positive perspective, the industry is not going anywhere. It's going to be aligned with what we do day in, day out. People are eager to jump on a plane. People are eager to try food. Um, people are willing to engage in, in the holistic wellness. But last but not least, what people will not change is that engagement factor. We need to provide solutions for them to make sure they do it in a, in a way that is risk mitigated and they feel safe about moving forward in the, in the right way.
Okay, look, okay. the audience no. questions are coming in thick and fast. I'm actually going to ignore my own questions now and just go to those, quite frankly. Yours are better. Well done. Um, and we're going to rattle through them because there are so many and I don't want anyone to feel that they haven't been heard this morning. So if we can keep our answers, guys, to about two minutes, then we can keep as many people happy as possible. And quite frankly, that's why I'm here. So here is one from David, and I'm going to put it to you, Ziad. David says... Does the unusual economic structure of the UAE mean that we will be less or more affected by the COVID recession? Ziad, what do you think? I think we'll be less affected because for many reasons. One of them is we have an infrastructure that is developed. We have a good healthcare service. We have a good monitoring service. We have a good transportation service. So if we, if we go from going to a restaurant to delivering food, we have the system there. We have all the, I mean, we still need to learn how to do it faster and so on. And as you know, out of the nine plus million population, the expats represent a big percentage of that. We faced it in 2008, where we had to uh, remove some of the outsourced services to save the economy and we were able to do so, unfortunately. So the, the answer is probably the UAE is the most uh, economy, is especially, I mean, specifically Dubai, is the most adaptable system to deal with such uh, emergency changes that are needed. The uh, second point is, as, as Naim said, we need to imp uh, implement an equivalent artificial intelligence in all the businesses that we do so we can move faster and monitor and analyze data. And, and this, in certain industries, we don't have it. But in general, I believe the economy is probably one of the most equipped, and, and we have seen it from the number of cases and how they handle them, and the number of centers of testing that they, they've risen up everywhere. I mean, comparing it to England, which I, I work a lot in and I'm, I'm, I live there. But I think the UAE is definitely capable. I mean, the question is, when will this end? And when do we see the end of it? The answer is not in the near future. As I said, whenever there is a disaster, there are always casualties and we have to live with them. Well, on the back of what Shukri said just a few moments ago, Adam has weighed in and said, I agree, Shukri, COVID will not be the last external shock in our lifetimes. Against this backdrop, what do we do now, engineering workforces, etc., as part of business continuity, balanced against cash flow considerations to put us in the right place for the next shock? And Shukri, as you said, that could be anything. That could be another virus, that could be climate change. So Shukri, what changes now put us in a better position for shock 2021, shock 2022? Yeah, th thanks for the softball, David. I mean, that, that's a tough question. So how, how, how should businesses really transform themselves but, but but in reality, I think there are there are probably three things uh, that, that I, I, I'll, I'll mention as call out. The first one is that uh, even though it's very tempting, let's not deal with the current crisis as a, as a reason just to cut costs tactically and think a little bit more widely about bringing efficiencies because those efficiencies are going to have more sustaining impact rather than a one off sort of solution or one of action. You don't want to be in a situation where you cut critical resources today. In six months, things become tighter and you cut it again and you go and you manage your business down simply because you've sacrificed really critical assets to your, uh, to your, um, um, uh, to your productivity and to your uh, distinctive uh, advantage. I think that's one. The second one is that think longer term in terms of, of, of how are you going to transform your business or even bring those efficiencies and increase productivity. The challenge is that many of those actually do require investments. So as we said, if I want to bring my operations or running costs down, I might need to invest in new, in new assets, uh, better assets, more efficient assets. If I want to actually more productive workforce, I'm going to have to invest in training. If I want a, a leaner sort of office or a more agile office, I probably need to invest in how the office is going gonna, is gonna to look and the experience I'm going to have to offer. If I want people to, to work uh, productively remotely, I'll need to invest in, 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 in collaboration and technology in general. I think the third, um, the third called out as well is that, uh, yeah, don't miss, don't miss the bigger trend that is impacting your industry. Uh, for just COVID. Uh, we talked about aviation, we talked about hospitality, we talked about tourism, we talked about retail. All those industries, uh, the, the, the pressure they are under at the moment 
isn't something that just happened in the past six months. What has happened is that COVID has made them very, you know, very violently sort of visible, and we were pushed to actually go and adapt them very quickly. But those underlying currents have been going on for years. COVID has accelerated that transformation, and therefore it's almost the question become disrupt yourself before you are abruptly disrupted. And that is going to require what, 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 uh, what I mentioned earlier, and I think Ziad then, then alluded to, that technological platform that really allows you to have that agility and that maneuvering space. Because in that sense, uh, the disruption is what's important. It's not the nature of that disruption. It's not the source of that disruption. But I have a, 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 a workforce that can work from anywhere. I have a very solid infrastructure that is not going to have disruption of services. I have a um, real, um, um, you know, intimacy with my customers. I know everything about their journey. I am able to adapt and go and find and make myself continue to be relevant, no matter what that disruption is. Those are some of the call outs that I think businesses need to keep in mind for the next waves. And that actually, because I'm going to, we've got about eight minutes left with you, and I'm going to roll a couple of questions that kind of say the same thing all in together. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Sarah. Which basically is, what now? I mean, we're one month into Q4. We've got two months left of 2020. A lot of people will be very glad to see the back of it, let's be honest. What do companies need to focus on now in the final two months of the year? We're in the winter season. This is normally a boom time for the UAE. Where should your focus be as a company? I'm going to give you two minutes each. Uh, Naeem, do you want to start? Focus very clearly for me, at least for my business. Um, excel at what you do best. Keep in mind what is happening around you globally, locally. Keep it relevant. And last but not least, diversify, making sure that we take the blinkers off and look at different sources of revenues that are in line with the market demand. That's how I'm seeing the, the next two months at least. Is he at? I think uh, you have to have a series of uh, short-term and long-term strategies, not just tactical moves and so on. But the main, the main important part is you're managing your cash flow because if you don't have your cash flow, you cannot survive. I mean, I just want to add another point to what Shukri has said. It's very good, uh, Cisco, a company like that, to do that. But it's just that you have to also adopt your operating model because your customers might not adopt to your system. And to survive, you need to be able to keep those customers going the same. Naeem has alluded to it. So it's a matter of cash flow and adopting at least a temporary working model with your clients to ensure they can also survive and they can afford you. Because if your clients are not there, it doesn't matter how efficient you are, you cannot survive. So I think it has to be an interactive dynamic model. What will happen in the UAE, we just have to live it out. I mean, it's like we had a major accident, the client is in a coma and will slowly recover. And there's a cost involved emotionally, socially, financially, medically. Uh, so we have to think aggressively and, and work with this amazing disruption that happened and think differently. This is my, my, my views on what is going to happen. Shukri, the last two months of 2020, where are you putting your energy? Where are you putting your, your firepower? I, I think it has been said before. I think don't, don't bet on it getting cold and COVID going away. Don't bet then about it getting warm in six months and COVID going away again. Don't bet on, on the vaccine coming out and 70% of the world population being vaccined in the next few months. That's just not going to happen, uh, which, which uh, you will be surprised, Brandy. A lot of the people are saying it's just a matter of months. They are literally waiting for this to happen before they go back. To their old ways. I think just get out there and reimagine re that reality. I agree with, with Ziad's message about uh, it is definitely an ecosystem. Everyone needs to adapt to this. That's why if I talk about my industry, have actually responded by how do you pay as you grow? How do you defer payments? How do I allow you to scale your capabilities and descale them through managed services, through cloud, through outsourcing, through all of that? Uh, absolutely. And one thing that, that has been mentioned as well, even when we deploy all those solutions or, or all that you know, technology and so on, there are certain things. You need to revisit your processes, and that's what we refer to by operating model. Do your processes, your way of work actually support 
working in that way? Do you actually have the culture and the value system that actually allows for people to operate under that theoretical operating model that you have designed in paper? We talked about the value of trust, for example. 70% during the past eight months believe that the trust with their employees have actually uh, went up, maybe because bosses don't have much option just to, other than to trust their people. And they have been productive. So I think there is a lot a lot to do, but my call out for the next two months, don't, don't wait until this goes away on its own at once. There you go. We will end on that note. That does bring us to the end of this week's webinar. A massive thank you to all of our panellists. Ziad Makzumi, serial entrepreneur, professional restructurer and corporate advisor. Naeem Madad, CEO and founder of Gates Hospitality. Shukri Eid, Managing Director for the Gulf Region at Cisco Middle East. And of course, uh, Cisco for partnering on this with us with the WebEx platform. I do have to say thank you to NASDAQ Dubai, where I am standing on this fabulous stage with this awesome display behind me. It is the heart of the region's trading markets. They're gonna to have to drag me back to my own studio. And I have to thank everybody who came in with questions as well. Adam, Nadine, Farah, Lara, Salvador, Thomas, Sarah, Ali. Great stuff, you've made my job a huge amount easier this morning. Don't forget, we are gonna be doing this every week for six weeks. Our next Back to Business session is on the 15th of November. We will be discussing digitalization and I'm gonna to have to give the microphone back to Richard Dean, which I do not want to do because the main speaker on that panel is going to be His Excellency Sheikh Faham Al Qasimi. He is a powerhouse uh, a very young, dynamic man who is leading the digital transformation of Sharjah. So I'm looking forward to that conversation. I wish I was the one running it. I'm not, but I feel immensely privileged to have been on this webinar this morning and to speak to everyone. So Ziad, Naeem, Shukri, thank you very much. And to our audience, thank you very much for giving us an hour of your time today. I hope that it was well worth it.